Some lures are sold for their ability to catch everything from bluegill to blue marlin. But in reality, they are all hype and no hook set. Other lures are great fish catchers, but they fail to capture the interest of the angler. And sometimes you get that perfect storm, a lure that appeals equally to both the fish and the fishermen. On today's episode of Retro Bass, we're going to take a look at one such lure, a lure that claims to be the world's first genetic response lure that makes fish bite even when they're not hungry. And you know what? They might just be right. Today, we are going to take a look at that 1990 sensation, the banjo minnow. It's the story of a lure that almost never came to be, and the modern day resurrection of a piece of old school gold. Stick around. Retro bassin, kicking some ass in, wearing rayon jackets. Thinking about Bill Dance, watching these fish prance through my Ray Ban glasses. Ain't nothing better than 40 year old lures coming off of Zepco 33. Out on the bass boat, making beer cans float, doing some trespassing. Fishing it old school, this old stuff rules. Welcome to Retro Bassin. The banjo minnow story starts out in the early 1990s in the Forks, Maine where fishing guide Wayne Hockmeyer decided to try his hand at bass fishing tournaments. Despite his best efforts, Wayne found himself stuck in the middle of the pack, tournament after tournament, and decided he needed a secret weapon. In the off-season, Wayne spent his time chasing white-tailed deer, where he became acutely aware of the predator-prey relationship, observing that lame or dying deer are the most susceptible to predation. Taking this lesson from the woods to the water, he concluded that game fish would also seek out injured or dying bait fish, and he set out to create a lure that could mimic that dying motion. Traditional lures like crankbaits and spinnerbaits, Wayne observed, move with a mechanical, almost unnatural action. And soft plastics, while they have the potential to be more realistic, they're rendered stiff by traditional Texas rigging methods. Though the initial prototypes were rudimentary, Wayne immediately went from the middle of the pack to winning tournaments. The guide turned tournament angler had finally found his secret weapon, which he planned to keep a secret until fishing buddies ultimately convinced him to make his invention public. Wayne enlisted the help of two individuals to turn his rough prototype into a sellable lure. The first was taxidermist Ken Daubert, who added realism to Wayne's original design. And the second, was soft plastic lure maker Joe Ranowski, who added scales, gills, and molded in sparkle. But if you truly want to understand what made this lure so special, it's probably best to listen to the inventor himself, Mr. Wayne Hockmeyer. It looks just like a real minnow. It has a lifelike appearance. Two, it, has, it is neutrally buoyant. It neither floats to the surface or goes crashing to the bottom. Three, it has random directional action. It goes up, down, sideways, all over the place. Four, it has random body movement. The body of the fish actually moves. And five is when it dies, it doesn't move at all. The same way a real dying minnow looks. These five things combined make this like no other lure in the world. And so anybody in the world can catch fish with the banjo minnow. But to me, the biggest innovation of the banjo minnow was the fact they took the hook out of the body of the bait and instead affixed to the nose with a screw-in nose anchor. In fact, the nose anchor was so critical to the design of the bait, it even made it into the original patent for the banjo minnow. This design modification accomplished two things. First, it took the backbone out of the bait, making it swim like a real minnow. And second, positioning the hook outside the plastic at the nose of the bait increased hookup ratios, especially when you consider that most fish attack the head of a bait fish or swallow it whole. The three inventors had the perfect minnow imitation. All they needed was the perfect name. Wayne noticed the rubber band weed guard that stretched from the eyelet to the barb resembled a banjo string. And before too long, the banjo minnow officially had its name. 
We knew if the banjo minnow was going to be anything more than a local phenomenon, he would need to reach the maximum number of anglers with a TV infomercial. Unfortunately, doing a big direct-to-consumer campaign requires a big bankroll and the guts to put it all on the line. And media backers were hesitant to bite on the banjo minnow concept. The original partners had run out of options before they met infomercial king Frank Canella, who was a media buyer for TriStar at the time. Frank was intrigued by Wayne's proposal, but lacked the fishing knowledge to know if the banjo minnow was the real deal or just another prank bait. So Frank called up the one fisherman he knew, producer-director Ken Carey, to help vet the idea. Ken immediately called Wayne to learn more about the banjo minnow, but Wayne was more interested in learning about Ken's own fishing knowledge. You see, Wayne had already turned down several producers because he knew he needed the right person to represent his product and only an avid fisherman could truly understand what he created. Well, lucky for Ken and lucky for the fishing world, Ken passed the test and was invited to fly to Maine to see the banjo minnow in action on the Penobscot River. The duo absolutely slayed bass and Ken was so enthralled with the banjo, he not only called Frank to say he wanted to produce and direct the infomercial, he also bought into the project. Wayne had the lure, the backer, and the director. All he needed was the infomercial. The first stop on the project was the largest outdoor show on the East Coast, the Eastern Outdoor Exposition in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. There, Ken and film crew hoped to get some underwater footage demonstrating the action of the banjo minnow in the famous hog trough, and hopefully a few testimonials from the several hundred spectators huddled around the tank. Fortunately, by the time the banjo film crew showed up, the tank's inhabitants had been watching crankbaits, spinnerbaits, and worms swim by for days and had developed a serious case of lockjaw. Wayne was visibly nervous as he slowly climbed the steps to the top of the hog trough and neither the film crew nor the spectators knew what was going to happen next. Wayne made his first cast, twitched the banjo minnow, let it die, twitched the banjo again, let it die, and bam, the first fish struck. Then another and another and another. And by the time Wayne pulled the banjo from the water on the first cast, it had been hit four times. That's it, and they can't resist. Just like that. It looks like a real fish to them. It has scales engraved right in it. It is translucent, and it fools them. It fools them so much, they don't, even, they don't want to let go of it. And yet, if you look at it and you're a fisherman, you're going to go, but I've never seen a bait look quite that good. I mean, it looks like it's alive. They're convinced it's real, they're programmed to eat it, and they eat it. The crowd became mesmerized as bass continued to attack the banjo minnow, cast after cast after cast. At one point, Wayne even pulled a spectator out of the audience and gave him a single cast to try to catch a fish on the banjo. And after some brief instruction from the inventor, a bass struck as if on command. Wayne climbed down from the hog trough triumphant, and what came next were 30 of the best testimonials that Ken ever captured on film. I'd say to the guy at home, believe it or not, I got picked up out of the audience and I thought it was absolutely fantastic. I really did, and that's no bull. It just is amazing. Nothing moves like this that I have ever seen. It's incredible. Very impressive what I've seen here today. I was really impressed. I said I was here the other day, I seen them putting crankbaits through there. They didn't catch a fish. And I seen some of these fish two and three times the same fish was hitting the waters. I was real impressed. It takes a lot to impress me too. As the TriStar team continued to build the ultimate infomercial, they took the banjo minnow on a 30-day fishing challenge where they attempted to capture footage of the banjo minnow catching as many species of fish on as many bodies of water as possible. From Canada to the Keys to California, the banjo minnow kept producing. The production team even went through the incredible time and expense of constructing a top secret 20 by 20 foot tank in Coral Gables, Florida. The tank was complete with vegetation, natural forage, and an underwater observation window through which the crew could film some of the first ever underwater strikes ever captured on film. To top it all off, the team assigned Bill Dance as a spokesman for the product, and Bill was reportedly shocked when Ken refused to give Bill a script 
but instead told him to share his honest feedback on the banjo. Well, the gamble paid off, and Bill's authentic testimonial was one of the most compelling of all. The infomercial first aired in 1995, and it absolutely exploded. Soon, banjo mania was running wild, and during a two-year stretch from 1996 to 1997, the banjo minnow was the number one selling lure in the world. And when all was said and done, they sold over 2 million kits. But any fisherman will tell you that feeding frenzies never last. Despite the lure's initial success, the eccentric inventor proved a challenging business partner. And in 1998, TriStar dropped the line. Wayne struggled to keep the banjo minnow afloat, but after several false restarts, Wayne finally decided to lay his banjo down for good. And were it not for a fateful smallmouth trip and an unlikely friendship years earlier, the banjo minnow story would have ended there. In some ways, on the banks of the Penobscot River in 1994, Ken Carey became the banjo minnow's most loyal customer. And through the years, even when not directly associated with the product, Ken continued to believe in Wayne Hockmeyer's dream of making the world's first genetic response lure that could make fish bite even when they aren't hungry. In 2020, Ken Carey and his wife Barbara acquired the Banjo Minnow brand and spent the next two years redesigning the Banjo Minnow with the help of feedback from those former 2 million Banjo Minnow customers. Ken and Barbara went through more than 10 designs, adaptations, and refinements, and tested new polymers, plastics, and formulations until they got the banjo right. After the process, they not only found the new design was ready for prime time, but the banjo was better than ever. Well, we are gonna take a look at the new school banjo minnow, but first I will show you the banjo minnow pack that sort of set me on this little banjo journey. As you guys know, I love to scour the internet for some old school fishing gold. And it wasn't too long ago that I picked up this, the Banjo 006 kit. Uh, I actually picked up a couple of these, ended up opening one of them. And first thing I'll say is I absolutely love this packaging of the Banjo Minnow that I think most likely came out in 2006. You can see the inventor Wayne Hockmeyer here, as well as their uh, 2006 spokesman, Babe Winkleman. Now, this was after the TriStar era of the banjo minnow, and Wayne was experimenting with the banjo design, and he actually went to this sort of a plastic harness. Truth be told, this was definitely a step down from the original screw-in nose anchor, and for that reason, anyone that has fished this model probably has experienced uh, some disappointment where this thing breaks off at the nose. I am glad I picked this up for display purposes, but when it comes to throwing the banjo minnow for bass, the new version is head and shoulders above this one. And first things first, what I love about the new kit is it is definitely built for the modern angler coming in that pouch that I think so many of us are used to. It does have some nice instructions on the back here. A nice new drawing of the Banjo Minnow, and again, pretty much looks like that 1994 patent, doesn't it? The Banjo Minnow, the world's only genetic response fishing lure. The Banjo Minnow can make fish bite, even when they are not hungry. <laughs> so let's check this thing out. So inside you get a couple of different things here. Looks like some packs. How many packs are inside? Okay, so we've got four packs inside. First thing is all of the hardware. So these are your hooks, your nose anchors, and your rubber bands. And all that comes in this nice little pack, which is Ziploc style, so you can reseal it. You also get four different colors of the Banjo Minnow, and they come in these nice resealable packs. And you can tell there's actually a nice little clamshell in there, which I love because that will keep those baits in their nice straight shape. This one is actually the most popular color, believe it or not, and this is the green, sort of looks like a baby bass or some sort of uh, green backed fish. And this one comes in, I believe, three different sizes in the pack. And you've also got the yellow, which Ken tells me is a really good color for stained water. 
a nice silver shad with a white belly. I love that one. That's totally going to be the one I throw on Lake Travis. And a brand new color for the banjo this year, watermelon. Ooh, look at that. That is a nice uh, sort of watermelony uh, fleck banjo back with a white belly. Man, Ooh, it's like new school gold, isn't it? Here is a new school version of the banjo minnow all rigged up with its nose anchor. And first thing I'll talk about is the plastic. Ken spent a lot of time trying to get the right plastic and I love this plastic. It's not too stiff like some of the old versions of the banjo, but it's not so fragile that if you get a fish or two on this, this thing is going to be toast. This thing definitely has some stretchability. I think Ken calls this living plastic. And oh yeah, look at that thing. Now, one other thing on the design of this bait, it is a really good looking design. It's got the molded in eyes and the nose of this bait is actually flattened a little bit. Ken did that originally to just help sort of insert that nose anchor into the nose to keep it center. But what he found is that flat nose actually creates additional disturbance at the front of the bait. And I imagine it probably adds to the erratic action of the banjo. We've got the classic metal nose anchor and the banjo hook. And yeah, look at that. You can totally see that if a fish were to hit the head, they're still going to get a hook in the mouth. And if they swallow the bait whole and you pull, the first thing that hits their lip is that hook. There is the classic rubber band that gives the banjo its name and we'll do my best Bill Dance impersonation and I'll show you how sensitive that thing is. If you're looking to pick up a new banjo minnow kit, head on over to buybanjominnow.com. Also definitely give him a follow on the YouTube and Instagram as well. You will not be disappointed with the old school gold they are still cranking out. And last, I definitely want to give a huge retro best and thank you to Ken Carey. Uh, without him, this episode would not have been possible. He sent us all the old school banjo minute footage and was gracious enough to listen to my questions uh, call after call as I dug deeper into the history of the banjo minnow. If you're looking for more old school content, click right here. Otherwise, I'll see you right back here, same time, same place. And until then, keep the carpet side up. And definitely, fish it old school. Fishing it old school, this old stuff rules. Welcome to Retro Bassoon.